Dr. Bantu, I'd love to know a little bit about your calling and what led you to pursue theological education and then specifically focusing in on ancient African Christianity? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, definitely. Well, um, yeah, I appreciate you asking. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, that, you know, my yeah interest in, in academics uh, and in, you know, early church and early African Christianity really, uh, I think it really comes out of a, a ministerial call um, and, uh, and just really overall sense of mission and, uh, and ministry. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I would, I would say that probably one of my biggest, um, concerns or issues that I'm really passionate about, uh, is, uh, it was evangelism. I, mean, I really have a heart of evangelism and wanting people to, uh, to know Jesus as Lord and savior. And, um, and I, I'm, I, you know, really ever since I was young, I've always been really concerned about, um, you know, just like this issue of like cultural alienation from the gospel or, and I mean, what I mean by that is like the idea that, um, that there's a kind of like an obstacle that often comes up in evangelism or in sharing the gospel with people, um, you know, just around the idea that Christianity is kind of like inextricably rooted to a particular culture and therefore is um, not an option for people who don't fit that culture. And to be more specific, like around the world, people have this perception that Christianity is a, like whatever they want to call it, like a Western religion or a white religion or an American religion, uh, whatever the case may be, or whatever the, the term that's used, people have this idea that Christianity is associated with a particular people. And if it's not their people, then the gospel can oftentimes be rejected just out of hand, um, even without really Un fully understanding or having heard the fullness and the richness of the message of the gospel and the person and work and life and teachings of Jesus, uh, oftentimes that that it's almost like the gift of Christianity uh, is covered by kind of the wrapping and the packaging of of like Western or white cultural identity. And I I got really attuned to this honestly even early at an early age because I I got saved uh, as a, at a, as a young person. I grew up in the in an urban context in the west side of St. Louis. Um, and I, I was saved at a young age and I, I always really wrestled with not seeing my own culture, uh, reflected, uh, in the church. And this was like, I grew up, you know, this is back in the eighties and this is kind of one of the, the first hip hop generation. And I didn't, you know, see people who looked or sounded or dressed or kind of acted like me reflected in church. I, I didn't, I didn't see a concept of what it looked like to be who I was culturally in the church. And on the flip side, people in church that I saw who were really uh, serious about Jesus didn't look, act, or sound anything like me or or my homies. And so that already engendered in me a sense of, okay, there's who I am, and then there's what Christians are, and the two are not the same. Um, and so as I grew in my desire and sense of call to ministry, I felt that I had to grow, grow further away from and kind of separate from who I was culturally. And, and, and then I would even, I remember trying to share the gospel with other friends in middle school and high school and in my neighborhood growing up. And, and, um, and a lot of them were just, you know, not interested in church or not interested in, in Christianity. And we, I, or them may, they as teenagers might not have been able to articulate why, but looking back now, I can see that, that a lot of it had to do with, again, the way that the gospel was being presented and the way the Christian life was being presented in a way that didn't resonate with the lifestyle and the identity that me and, 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 and my community really had and espoused. And so, um, you know, I, uh, ended up, you know, uh, I was really, you know, concerned about this and I ended up feeling called to ministry and I had this desire to learn and to study and be able to study the word. So I went off to Christian college. I left my community and went off to a Christian college and, and, uh, and, you know, I think I became even more, uh, concerned about this now that I was kind of in the, I guess, in the, in the halls of, um, you know, uh, Christian academia and theology. And I was also, again, kind of not seeing myself reflected, um, you know, or seeing my people reflected in, in theology or the way that theology and church history is being taught. So I became even more kind of concerned about it. Uh, and also I became opened up to, again, how this, this issue um, is really uh, this perception of Christianity being a Western or white religion is really a, a global is issue and a global crisis. And uh, for, you know, people in First Nations communities or indigenous communities or in the Middle East or 
uh, in you know Central and East Asia, all over the place, that people have uh, people have this you know varying similar perspective um, on Christianity being linked to one culture. And so I I think that's what really made me really passionate about the importance of contextualizing the gospel, and that for people to really own the Christian story uh, according to their own people and tribes and cultures. And I started reading a lot of missiology and, 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 you know, uh, things on cross-cultural theology and ministry and started really becoming interested in that. But I think when I, I think what really, um, grabbed my attention was actually, uh, after college, I, you know, wanted to go study more to prepare for ministry. And so I went to seminary and when I was in seminary, my first year, I took a class on the, the, uh, the ancient, I saw a class that was listed called the ancient African church. And I was like really taken by, it. I was like, what is that? Like, I, I didn't even know there was an ancient African church, you know? And, um, and so I took this class and it was actually a trip to Egypt where I explored a lot of the early Egyptian and Nubian sites of early Christianity. And I had never heard of any of those things. It was brand new information. And, and I was really, I was really um, taken with that. I always joke and say, I, I've never really come back from that trip. I'm still kind of on it. Cause I, I, from, from the word go, I became really um, fascinated with it because, again, I was really interested in issues of contextualization and, and, and missiology. But a lot of those conversations usually are happening in the modern era. And, and, it's, and it's usually kind of a way of how we can decolonize our faith or deconstruct Eurocentricity or kind of move away from a kind of a maybe a colonial uh, imposition of Christianity that many people of color have had to grapple with and have therefore have wrestled with this. And while those conversations are necessary, I was really interested in ancient Christianity in Africa and in other non-Western parts of the world, because the thing that really interested me was that these were not like kind of post-colonial or decolonial or anti-colonial uh, theologies, but these were what I like to call a colonial theologies. Like these are, there was actually, the, the, you know, it was really empowering to find out that that, you know, there were actually Christian traditions that developed completely free from colonialism or from Westernization or from kind of any kind of imposed uh, thing, and that they were able to freely develop in their own language and their own culture and their own kind of frameworks and their own theologies. And I just felt like, man, if more people knew uh, that, that could encourage a lot of the conversations for those of us who have had to deal with, you know, kind of deconstructing colonialism and oppression and white supremacy it might really can help to connect with and learn and be inspired by people who have been able to imagine God and read the Bible uh, and interpret and, and do theology in a way that has been free from colonialism. Uh, that, that, and that, that also could just help change. Uh, and that, that, number one, it can help believers, honestly, to really connect with the fullness of the body of Christ. But also it can help in, in our evangelism, again, that for people who have these ideas that Christianity is a Western or a white man's religion, it, it blows that concept out of the water to say, to realize that, that Christianity is global now and it's always been global uh, from day one. Whew, that is beautiful. That's fantastic. And I want to dig into uh, that discovery period when you were in Egypt and kind of like looking into the, the rich Christian history that was developing, how theology was being developed in Africa, separate from what we know of like reform theology and things that were happening in Europe. Like that's very popular, but so I want to dig into that before I do, you touch on something in the beginning of your story that I want to dig into with you. And that is about finding our cultural identity at church and how important that is to see our culture, our identities reflected in church leadership. Um, I'm Latino, but I, I have white privilege. And when I was at a church, I went to pretty much white church. In my area, is pretty much white churches that I've attended. And so I was really kind of ignorant to, to that whole world of like, oh, when somebody is coming in from a marginalized community or doesn't fit into the demographic of the church and they don't see themselves represented in leadership, like the impact that has on them. And it wasn't until I got, my wife is um, Asian American. So my children are Asian American. And it wasn't until 15 years ago that my daughter was born that I began to really see through a new lens. And I started to look at my church and going, I'm not seeing women in leadership. I'm not seeing Asian people in leadership at my church. And so I began to just like, I began to think about all these things. And so shortly after that, I ended up moving to a church that was uh, pretty much half or more Asian American, because I really wanted my children, I wanted my family to see themselves in leadership roles. I wanted them to see like, 
their cultural identity being celebrated and honored within Christianity. But before that, I was totally ignorant to it. I wasn't even aware 15 years ago. So as as you were kind of sharing that journey, I just want to like like dig into that, like um, how important it is for people to realize. Because again, to me, it was brand new. Like this is 15 years ago. I wasn't even a thing. I never even thought about it. Like why is it so important to see have diversity and leadership and also the impression your church is making if you are not representing uh, different ethnicities in leadership? Yeah, yeah, I, that's such a great question. You know, um, I actually uh, just want to quickly um, quote. I have this uh, have just this thing here from uh, Robin D'Angelo's book, uh, White White Fragility, and and she gives some kind of staggering percentages here to help to visualize in 2021 uh, or in when the book was written in the last few years about how white supremacy still functions in the world today. Uh, you know, and she just basically gives some quick kind of numbers on some of the most influential sectors and aspects of the world and of U.S. civilization and how dominated it is by white, uh, by white people. And, uh, you know, she's so here's just some quick numbers. She says, um, out of the 10 richest U.S. Americans, 100 percent of them are white. Um, and uh, and seven of those 10 are the richest in the world. Um, and the U.S. Congress is 90 percent white. U.S. governors are 96 percent white. Uh, the top military advisors are 100 percent People who decide what TV shows we see are 93% white. People who de decide what books we read, 90% white. People who decide what news is covered, 85% white. People who decide what music is produced, 95% white. Teachers are 82% white. Full-time college professors are 84% white. And the owners of men's professional football teams are 97% white. And so, again, she's just given us a quick glance of like how much white people control every aspect of our entertainment, politics, culture, military, like every aspect of our society is dominated by white people. Um, and, and I just share that to say that it is, um, it, it, you know, it's important to everybody, clearly, it's important to everybody to be represented. Uh, and, and oftentimes the people who are most out of touch with how important it is, ironically, are the people who are running things. And it makes all the sense in the world to not be in touch with it because white people would probably be the first people to say, oh, it doesn't matter to me who's in charge or it doesn't matter to me if I'm represented and, and all that kind of stuff. And even times we'll say things like, why do we have Black History Month? Why do we have Hispanic Heritage Month? Why do we have these things? Where's the White History Month? And I'm like, look around you. The world is in White History Month every minute of every day. Um, and, and again, it's harder to to uh, acknowledge that it's like explaining water to a fish um, or, you know, another another uh, analogy I heard someone use once I thought was helpful is like being a minority. And I think minority is like being left handed and being white is like being right handed for left handed people. My oldest daughter is left handed, left handed people bring up their handedness on a regular basis. Like they are reminded of their handedness on a regular basis when everything balconies and desks and in so many things are made for right-handed people. And so if you're right-handed like me, you don't, I don't hardly think about the fact that I'm right-handed because the world is made for me. The world is made according to my handedness and, and, and it's made to accommodate me, but it is not made to accommodate people like my daughter who are left-handed. And so that's what it's like to be non-white. And so again, it's important to everyone. Um, and, but for white people often are not in touch with this because so much of, of society and the church is governed by, I mean, she didn't get into the church, but if we were to get into book seminary books or co Christian college books, or, or even just books that most Christians read or theologians that people quote from, or the, 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 the leaders that your pastor quotes from when he preaches or, or even who are the preachers and the, the people we look to the, the authors and leaders, the denominations that we are a part of who are in the top leadership, like it would be probably the same staggering uh, uh, you know, numbers. And so this is important to everybody, including white people. In fact, it's probably even more uh, important for white people. And it's more insidious because they're not oftentimes as aware of how much they actually want to be led by other white people. Um, and, 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 you know, we, for example, I mean, how many times in a, in a quote unquote multi-ethnic church, which is usually often really a white church, like, or predominantly white in terms of culture. You have so many churches where it might be 80 or 90% white, but you'll often see people of color, Asian, black, Latino, Native American, you'll often see people of color coming into and sitting under white leadership. 
in churches. How often do you see white people doing the same? How often do you see white people going and sitting under the authority of a black pastor in a majority black church or in a majority Hispanic church and so on and so forth? So if anything, the, the you know, the numbers are showing us that minorities seem more willing to actually be led by leadership that looks different than them than white people are. And so it's important to all of us in a, 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 in a good way, because there's a good way that we should value being represented because cultural and racial distinction is part of God's identity for us. So, you know, we, we, we want to avoid either extreme of idolizing our culture. And again, I would say white Christians do this more than anybody. Um, but but all of us can fall into the, ter- the temptation of of making an idol and making too much over our being represented and, and our cultural identity. But we also want to avoid the opposite extreme of self hate and denying who we are, and that every, every each and every one of us represents the image of God in a unique way, just like male and female equally represent the image of God in unique ways. Men represent the image of God in ways that women do not and cannot represent the image of God. And women represent the image of God in unique ways that men cannot and do not represent the image of God. And we need each other in order to fully reflect as humanity, the image of God. And it's the same thing with race, that black people, Asian, Native American, white people, all of us represent the image of God in unique ways and we need each other. Uh, and we, and we, that means that we need to, that, that right there brings the balance of showing that we need to, we can't make an idol of ourselves and think that we're all it because we're incomplete without everyone else. And yet at the same time, we can, we also have to avoid the, the other extreme of self-hatred and say, but I am a part of the body as well. I am just as much a part of the body and I might be the eye or the hand or the foot or the knee, but I am just as integral to the body as everything else that is united under the head of Jesus Christ. And we are living in a time where the white part of the body has gotten way too much overexposure in the global body of Christ. And yet, and, 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 and believers of color have gotten so little uh, representation and leadership and presence. And so it's necessary for all of us to be reflected in the body of Christ. Peter, when God spoke to him in Acts 10, he said, kill and eat at the animals on the sheet. And he said, I'm not touching anything that's unclean. And God said, do not call unclean what I have made clean. And we know that God was preparing Peter for the reception of the Gentiles into the church. That Gentile, he was getting Peter ready for the person, the Cornelius that God was leading to salvation. And so the message there was actually more for Peter than it was for Cornelius. The message was, you need to understand that Gentiles are just as much a part of this body of Christ as the Hebrews are. And in Acts 15, the the Jerusalem Council decided that not only are Gentile believers admitted into the covenant people of God, but they're admitted as they are. They don't have to assimilate. They don't have to be circumcised like the Hebrews are. Now, that doesn't mean the Hebrews need to stop being circumcised. That doesn't, you know, Acts, Acts 21, James was talking to Paul and said, well, wait, it's, it, we, you know, some people think that you're telling Jews to not be Jewish anymore. And that's not at all what, what, what Paul was teaching or what James was teaching. Jewish people still be Jewish. Paul took those brothers into the temple and paid for their temple uh, purification rites. So Jews keep being Jews and Gentiles keep being Gentiles. And we're all united under the body of Christ. And all of us need to see and hear ourselves reflected. And that's why Paul went to great lengths to communicate the gospel to the Gentiles using their own literature, quoting their own poets, and using their own concepts like John does when he calls Jesus the Logos. He's talking about who God is in frameworks and concepts that Platonic or Stoic educated Gentiles can understand. That, And I mean, in Acts 6, we see already the, 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 the ethnic tension between the Hebraic and the Hellenistic Jews. And you see leaders from the Hellenistic Jewish people group being empowered to lead their own people. And so we see all over scripture that it is important for people to have leadership that looks like and reflects them. And in so doing, we reflect the Trinitarian Godhead, who himself is eternally distinct and unified as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's one God, but he's also distinct. And the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all are distinct entities that are unified as one God. And all of us as humanity are unified and distinct at the same time. And all of us need to uh, reflect and see ourselves reflected in church leadership and in every other aspect of church life. Fire, fire, fire emoji right there. Oh, my gosh. That is so good, Dr. Bantu. Uh, Yeah, that is that is 100 percent accurate. And um, I want to go back to what you started with the beginning with just sharing the data 
about white supremacy and just the over indexing of how white people are over indexing in like entertainment news, you know, who's writing the news, um, our books. And as you were sharing those numbers, I was thinking back to right after um, we all witnessed the murder of George Floyd on video as that was going viral. And I think a lot of us uh, were doing check ins. Like I was going to check into myself, like, what have I been doing to support? Uh, my the black community. What am I personally doing to mentor at work? And I was just checking into myself and realizing all the ways that I've been missing, like things that I need to improve on. And while I was doing my own personal check in, I was looking at my library, my and I have a lot of theology books that I've collected over the years. And I think everybody that I have is pretty much white. Um, the reformers, Calvin, Luther. And then going even, even into modern theology, Wesley, Spurgeon, like they're all white and they're, and great theology. I learned, I've learned so much, but I'm like, I am missing a huge perspective um, about all, and, and so many different spaces, Asian American theology, black theology. And so I, I just started doing a check-in. I was like, oh man, I see it now. Like I see it and I need to, I have, I have so much to learn. And so I began to just like, I started Googling to like find black theologians and people that have been talking about liberation theology and just how important that is. Um, and so everything you were just sharing is like dead on. So like for, for those of us who are kind of in this place where we're recognizing maybe the white supremacy in our own libraries, in our churches, and we want to start to kind of, um, I want to start exploring um, other traditions. I want to do a better job of loving um, my neighbor and appreciating uh, different perspectives. What would be some steps you would say for, especially white Christians uh, who are who are like they're knowledgeable now, they're kind of awake to what's happening, but now they actually want to take some actionable steps. Yeah, I think that's a great question, and I mean, I think all of us. I mean, you know. Well, believers that are white, but all of us honestly really need to do that. I mean, even as an African American believer, I I also feel called to learn, especially right now with how many uh, how how much uh, many of our Asian American brothers and sisters are experiencing racism and white supremacy in in its anti Asian form. You know, I also want to be you know learning uh, from other people as well and people of color. And also, as you said earlier, it's, uh, you know, the call here isn't to jettison or throw away you know some of the good contributions that have come out of Western or white Christian. Christianity, but again, it's just to, as again, as Paul said in First Corinthians twelve, give greater honor to the parts of the body that have lacked it. Meanwhile, our special parts are need no special treatment, right? Uh, and so, uh, and 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 the goal there is equality, uh, so that everything you know becomes kind of uh, you know on the equal standpoint. But that's something that I try to live out as well. And I, I would say, you know, um, you know, really two. I guess you know, there's so much we could say about that. But I would just give maybe two quick steps. Is that in terms of, uh, I think that all of us, but especially white believers. All of us uh, really have two things that we can do. And number one is to really get into other spaces and get into other contexts and just learn and listen and, and just sit at the feet of other people and other cultures. Uh, and just and, and, you know, I mean, you know, I've had the, the privilege and opportunity to just through relationships and through different contexts to, you know, uh, to really be. I mean, one of my closest mentors in my life is Dr. Soon Chan Ra, uh, who has taught me a lot about uh, just about the gospel and about the church. And but also, especially in times like this, when I'm seeing. Uh, how my Asian American brothers and sisters are are suffering uh, and experiencing white supremacy. You know, it's helpful to have relationships and mentors uh, like him who can really help me to know how to be a good ally. So that it's not like a tokenizing thing, or it's not like a oh, can you help me fill my quota to you know do something good for Black people or for Asian people? But it's out of a relationship. And also, and, and I mean, another example is like institutionally is like, you know, I'll give a shout out to uh, Nate's, uh, which is, um, is it's called Nate's an indigenous learning community, which is a consortium and a community of indigenous theologians. And that's a, a community I'm a part of. And I just, it's a, it's been a great opportunity for me again, as an African American to sit at the feet of and be a part of a, an annual gathering and, and a, and a space that I would recommend to anybody. Um, and, uh, but to be welcomed into that, 
uh, even uh, to learn about some of the ways that indigenous people are have been and still are suffering uh, right, white supremacy and land violation and genocide and all other kinds of forms of racism, even at the hands of people who claim to be Christians and, and things that have been done to uh, their communities in the name of Christianity. It's been so blessed. It's such, been such a blessing for me to be able to connect with other people of color and to go to their conferences and go to their spaces and read books. And I think all of us have time and, and opportunities to go to conferences, go to churches, uh, go to, um, you know, uh, go into spaces and reading books that are in, as you mentioned, like going into reading other books and just trying to sit at the feet and listen and learn and, uh, and, and, um, and just hearing and listening, uh, rather than always feeling like we need to ask a question or always jump to like the, what can I do? You know, how can I fix these things? But just to really just sit and listen and learn and, and, and lament and just kind of pause, you know, before trying to come with answers or come with like questions that really try to are ultimately aimed at us trying to escape the pain of lamenting and, and grieving the sin, uh, the corporate and systemic sin that's been done. But to, again, just to stop, listen and learn and learn and lament, um, you know, from different communities. And then I think the second thing is that we need to look inwardly at our own people and our own context, and we need to engage prophetically. And I think this is true for all of us. Um, but especially if we're talking about white believers, you know, oftentimes, um, you know, uh, a lot of times, in, you know, you know, people of color will will have trauma be added on to by sometimes well, uh, you know, partially well intended white people coming to ask lots of questions. I mean, you mentioned George Floyd, like I think I can speak for many black pastors and leaders that, you know, this summer our phones and email accounts were blowing up with white evangelicals saying, what can I do? What can I you know, how, what can I do? And um, and and while that's, you know, well intentioned uh, and honorable in some ways. Um, oftentimes there can be a burden placed on people of color to kind of be the teacher or to be the, the voice or to be even the prophet to speak truth. When in reality, white supremacy is a mess that white people have made. And so it's really not appropriate to ask people of color to clean up the mess that has been made by white people. And there are many people of color who are willing and ready to link up and partner. But oftentimes those people of color get taken advantage of and get abused in white evangelical space and they burn out. And I think that, again, first and foremost, white people need to deal with their own issue. And whether it's at the Thanksgiving table or whether it's at the board meeting or the elder meeting or uh, whether it's in conference form or book or blog or podcast form uh, or one on one conversation, uh, white people need to speak prophetically and take up the brunt of the bulk of the work of challenging and speaking against systemic racism and dis and destabilizing and deconstructing it. Um, and, and also people of color need to do the same in their own communities as well uh, for the ways in which we have also, uh, you know, imbibed and appropriated many aspects of, of racism and, and oppression, even ourselves. Yeah. And you touched on such a really important topic, which is when a marginalized community is suffering, um, when there's violence done to that community, when they're being re-traumatized. It's super important for other communities to reach out to support and care and voice their um, voice their concerns and stand with those communities. But also at the same time, like you're saying, like being careful not to add extra burden to like, can you educate me? What sh you know, when it, when somebody's hurting, when they're going through anxiety, depression, that's not the time to start burdening them with like requests for blog posts podcasts, right? Whatever it is, like you need to let them grieve. And then when they're ready, they can come and talk to you. But in the meantime, you know what you can do. You can go on Google, you can go research, you can get involved. You can like begin to make some statements, make donations. There's things that we can all do. Um, but when a community is hurting, that's like, you need to just love them, pray for them, let them know that you're there, that you're well, willing to listen, but don't be asking for things. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and go to their churches. I mean, like, go, you know, go just go. And, and as I mentioned, just just rather than at, like you said, rather than asking for things, go to the Hispanic church, go to the black church, go to the native church, the Asian church. You just go and again, go sit and listen and learn. And and because, again, there are initiatives and there are things happening. Um, but again, that's also part of um, I mean, you know, just to give an example, I mean, like I see so many minority church planters or minority directors of nonprofits struggling all the time, uh, you know, so often, not all the time, but so often in minority communities and in low income communities 
when uh, to get their initiatives off the ground. Whereas whether it's missions or whether it's like partnerships, like white Christians are usually more likely to give money to and give resources and get behind the initiatives of white people, even if those initiatives are aimed at helping or reaching a certain people group. So, but again, there, you know, just to agree with what you're saying, like there are initiatives that are already happening. So folks want to do something if they want to, if they want to get involved, black people, indigenous people, like minorities are already, they're already start. We have churches and we have, uh, you know, initiatives and we have like, you know, things that are going on, just go and go sit at those meetings, go, go to those church services and just sit and listen and learn and, be led in those spaces. Um, you know, just, yeah, just agree with what you're saying. Yeah. And, and, and I think also like, uh, especially for white Christians, when marginalized communities, I'm thinking specifically of our black communities and right now our Asian American communities that are uh, constantly being traumatized. Um, it's super important to be in those social media conversations when we see, cause unfortunately, as we've seen this rise of Christian nationalism and especially with Trump and like how that's impacted, uh, social policy and our borders and it's, it's changed perspectives of certain Christians to be very polarizing. And there's a lot of hate there. Like you, you've seen like the racism and the hate that's all tied into like kind of the Republican Christian national nationalism and the rhetoric there. Like I want to speak up all the white Christians need to be like opposing that, like in those, when you see those tweets go out, reject that, reject the hate be be visible stand up for our communities getting into uh back to your journey as you began to ex you're in egypt and you began to just explore um ancient um african christianity i'm curious about some of the things you were uh initially seeing and really excited about yeah yeah there, well i mean i think you know number one i mean just to know that that christianity was in africa uh, for, you know, and has been in Africa for the entirety of the history of the church that, uh, that, yeah, well, you know, that was just, that in and of itself was an empowering thing to, to find out. Uh, I mean, I did feel some type of way about the fact that I was finding out, <laughs> you know, in seminary, uh, when I had already been a Christian for almost 20 years and I, I, you know, was involved in ministry and I had already studied theology in college and, and I'm just now finding this out. I'm like, I should have known that already. Um, but that's part of, you know, why I do what I do so that hopefully people can start to find out sooner. Um, and, 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 uh, that, but even just that was powerful because so often many black people and many people period, uh, have this narrative that for black people, Christianity was introduced through slavery. Uh, and that before slavery, black people didn't know the gospel. There were no black Christians or African Christians. And, um, and, and so that was really powerful just to find out that the beginnings of, of Christianity for African people, uh, on the continent and in the diaspora did not begin with slavery. Um, but that, that God was actually already at work among African people from the very beginning. Um, and then I think another thing, or just, I mean, there's so many things, uh, that, that I could say, but, I think another thing that really stood out, and this actually is what led me into my dissertation research uh, uh, for my topic in, in, in my PhD was, uh, and I get into this a, a bit in my book, um, Multitude of All Peoples. But, you know, I think one thing that stood out to me that was also kind of encouraging, even though, you know, in a way it's kind of discouraging because there was a major church schism in the fifth century that I talk about in the book in the year 451, the Council of Chalcedon. And, and that was kind of the dividing point between a lot, the majority, the overwhelming majority of most of these ancient African Christian communities, and actually many of the communities in the Middle East and in Asia, this was actually kind of the big breaking point between the Church of the West and the Church of Africa and Asia. And, and that's a major reason why so many of us in, you know, in the West today have never, have never heard of these communities, because since the year 451, they've been split. And, and, uh, and so, and then Protestantism kind of came out of the church that, that, that split after the year 451 over a thousand years later. And so we, there's just been kind of this rift that, that, and we've never really connected with it. Um, so, I mean, that's a bad thing and that's, that's lamentable. Um, but one of the interesting things and actually kind of encouraging things about that even in the midst of that sad thing was for me to learn and realize that not only have, have there been Christian churches in Africa since the very beginning of the church, but not only that, but also that they had a unique theology that was distinct from the European theology. Uh, and, and that, and that in fact, not only was it distinct, but it was actually at odds with the European theology. In fact, there's a long and ugly history of 
Western Christian persecution of African Christians, um, you know, in the four and five and six hundreds. And so, uh, and so despite the, the fact that that's a bad thing, it's actually kind of encouraging because again, so many people think that Christianity is a Western white religion and it only started for black people in slavery. And there's even a lot of people in the black community around the world, whether it's in the, in the Americas or in Europe or on the continent, there's many people of African descent that, that sometimes think that, you know, Christianity came from the white man and it was imposed upon us. And, uh, and we've just kind of kind of imbibed and regurgitated a Eurocentric Christianity. And so it's really encouraging actually to find out that not only were there African Christians from day one, but they also maintained their own distinct doctrine and their own distinct African theology that was not only different from the European theology, but it was actually even like a, that there was a, a strong sense of tension. So that just speaks to the, the ingenuity and, uh, and the independence of, of ancient African Christianity. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, this is like all new to me. Like, this is super exciting to hear this because, um, like I said, the churches I was raised in uh, primarily prov uh, provided like theology from from Europe. Like, that's where a lot of the theology that I was taught. And so, um, as you're as you're talking and, and discussing like the theology and the churches that were in development in Africa at the same time, as you're kind of as you kind of like because you're coming in already like studying the Bible, already knowing theology. Now you're learning about um, African Christianity. What were some of the things that were happening maybe like in Europe? Because like the Reformation happening, like what, what, 1500 um, in Africa. I mean, I was kind of curious, like, are there any correlations in doctrines or uh, areas where there were uh, differences that were kind of emerging between these, the churches in Europe and the churches in Africa? Yeah. De oh, definitely. Well, and, and again, I think that um, that 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 council that I just mentioned, and then kind of the a lot of the tension and the schism that grew out of that is probably the best example to just talk about some of the correlations, but also some of the the differences between the Christianity that became dominant in in what would later become known as Europe, and then the Christianity that became dominant in what would later become known as Africa. Um, and and again, the Council of Chalcedon was a a Roman Church council that was was trying to figure out how to, you know, talk about the humanity and divinity of Jesus. Now, we, now again, you mentioned correlations and see, this is another point of, this is another uh, point of importance because another reason why so many of these ancient African and Asian Christian churches have been denied throughout history and underlooked uh, or overlooked uh, and understudied is because um, they've often been erroneously or unnecessarily been deemed as heretics uh, and you can honestly see this narrative being this Eurocentric narrative being regurgitated even in many evangelical Western modern church history textbooks. Like in the omission of many of these church histories, they're often not mentioned, or if they are mentioned, they're briefly kind of just brushed aside as heretical. And the Council of Chalcedon uh, in 451, the, which was uh, which was uh, superintended by the Roman Empire and the and the the Pope of the Roman Church, is often presented as like the perfect middle ground, as it was like the the best way of articulating the humanity and divinity of Jesus. Now, to be clear, all of the Christians in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, the majority of Christians in these parts of the world, and the popes and the main leaders of these different places, they all believed that Jesus was fully God and fully human, and that he was the only way, truth, and the life, the, and they believed in the incarnation, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the Trinity. Everybody is a Christian. Everybody agreed on the fundamentals of the faith, and everyone believed that he was fully God and fully human. But they they had different ideas about how to talk about that and how to word it or how to phrase it. And the uh, Council of Chalcedon basically uh, put out the language of saying that Jesus is one person, but he has two natures. So his humanity and divinity are unique natures, but they both exist in the one person. So a lot of that has to do with kind of like your understanding of Greek and Greek concepts and the difference between person and nature in that language. But some of these other people in other places and in other languages didn't have the same nuance between person and nature. And so in, in Africa, for example, many of the churches in Egypt and Nubia and Ethiopia, they did not like that definition because to them it sounded like what was being said was that there are two Jesuses. Now, to be fair, that's not what the Roman church was saying, but that's how it felt. And so they said, oh, he's one nature. Now, conversely, the Roman church misunderstood their theology and still does to this day. And, and basically kept 
caricaturize their theology as saying, well, you don't really believe, if you say one nature, that means you don't really believe Jesus is fully human. You think he's only God. Now, that's not at all what they were saying. That's not at all what the Egyptian or the Ethiopian church has ever believed. They have always believed in the full humanity and full divinity of Jesus. They just have a problem with the language of two natures. And so they say one nature. Um, but they believe that that one nature is both fully God and fully human, just like the Western church believes that the one person of Jesus is fully God and fully human. So it was really a lot of semantic, linguistic, cultural, political differences that led to this major schism. But since the Roman church had more power, they came in and started to impose their theology. And you actually had Roman popes and bishops and monks backed by Roman soldiers and the Roman emperor coming into Egypt and coming into Syria and Arabia and imposing their doctrine and saying, you have to say two oh, natures. Wow. If you don't believe in two natures, you're not a Christian and we're going to kill you. And they literally did often either kill church leaders in, in the Middle East or in Africa, or they would sometimes kidnap them and put in place a Roman leader that, that had their doctrine. So this was centuries of Christian on Christian violence that took place up until the Islamic conquest. And by the time the Muslims came on the scene in the 600s, many of the Christians in this part of the world, they had already been being persecuted by Roman Christians for 200 years. And so by the time the Muslims came and took over the Persian empire and the Eastern half of the Roman empire, the Romans just left and abandoned those Christians. And then they became double minorities under in, in their own lands, but now under Islamic hegemony, which is still the case to this day. And, and it's that kind of, church trauma that causes people to, to leave that tradition and to look elsewhere or just be done with religion in general because they've been traumatized by the very church that's supposed to be helping them. That's well, and you know, that's, I think that often can be true. But one of the things that's interesting about, about this history, about the history of like, for example, the Syrian uh, church or the Egyptian church is that what's interesting is that even in the midst of all that persecution and in the midst of being told they're not real Christians because they don't they don't say two natures, they say one and all that. I mean, it's just a schism that really should not have happened. Um, but despite that, they actually that actually encouraged them to dig deeper into their own their own tradition and and actually claim their own Egyptian Christian tradition or their own Syrian Christian tradition or their own Persian Christian Christian tradition and reject the Roman church. So it's interesting because rather than rejecting, I think there's a lesson actually in this for a lot of modern Christians today as we, and this is why I was saying earlier how it can be helpful for people of color, especially Christians of color who have, have to grapple with decolonization and, and, and church hurt and, and, and the, the implicit, the kind of the complicitness of the church with Christian nationalism and all that kind of stuff. What's interesting is that in these ancient churches, they did not allow the oppression and the kind of over emphasis of theological and linguistic semantic nuance to ruin Jesus for them. They still clung tightly to Jesus and to their own tradition. And what they did is they rejected the Western church. They didn't reject the church. They didn't reject the gospel. They rejected the Western version of it. And they clung tighter to their own. And they basically said, we are Orthodox. We are the real Christians. We are the real church. This is what the Egyptian, the Ethiopian, the Syrian church said to themselves. And that was actually what helped them to weather the storm of European Christian oppression and then later Muslim oppression. And that is what has helped them survive even to this day. 1,400 years later, they are still alive and kicking, even though they're still being persecuted. They're still being martyred by their faith on beaches in Libya. They are still, it, the more they are persecuted, they, they get more passionate about it. They tattoo it on their wrists, on their foreheads. They let every, and they, they do this in places where they can be killed for their faith in Jesus Christ. And it really, I think it's a really strong testament, again, to many of us who um, I think many of us need to learn from that kind of faith and that kind of resilience, because so often we will see things like the Capitol in January and we will lump in. We will allow we will allow American exceptionalistic white supremacist oppressive expressions or really perversions of Christianity we will allow that to speak for the church of Jesus Christ. And we will think that that is the true representative. And then we will sometimes be tempted to, or as you said, reject the church on those grounds. But we have to, we have to learn from the Coptic and the Syrian faith of old and say, no, no, no. When, when we reject uh, Trumpian Christianity, when we reject, uh, the, when we reject uh, the Christianity of Charlottesville or the Christianity that invaded the Capitol, that's not even Christianity. So we're not rejecting the true church of Jesus Christ. In fact, we cling tighter to the church of Jesus Christ, the true church of Jesus Christ that stands for justice and reconciliation and truth. 
uh, and, and we reject an imperial uh, kind of perversion of, of Christendom. Who and that that's like as you're talking about that, I'm like, that is the Holy Spirit too. Like that's like the Holy Spirit of Paul that we read about. Like as he's being persecuted, he just wants to run the race. He just wants to keep going, pressing forward. And how beautiful, like in the midst of all this, in the midst of the trauma, in the midst of the pain, like rejecting the uh the violence, rejecting um everything that is that is not of God and just holding 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 fast to Christ and scripture and just digging digging in even deeper like that's beautiful and it reminds me of uh early america where uh you had pastors and churches supporting slavery and even handing out like a slavery bible even hiding parts of scripture so that um uh, black people in america wouldn't see a a gracious god they would see like oh god endorses slavery according to this bible and the black church like rejected that and pressed in and looked at how much liberation is in scripture. That's right. That's right. And, and that's a great example. I think the black church is a great example of like the ancient Coptic or, or Syrian churches that also that found refuge in the church of Jesus Christ as a, not, you know, not seeing the church as a vehicle of oppression, but seeing it as the refuge and actually a vehicle of liberation. Because the black church, I mean, the oldest piece of property owned by African-Americans is a church, is Bethel AME in Philadelphia. And so what does that say that in the midst of a, uh, I pointed this out in one of my classes at Fuller, because we're reading The Color of Law and 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 looking at how the, how the segregation in the U.S. has been strategically orchestrated to keep African-Americans from owning property. And, and in a place, in a country where black people have been historically and systemically and still are kept out of home ownership and property ownership, it's so indicative, it's so symbolically powerful to, to realize that in, this, in the midst of that marginalization, the oldest piece of property owned by African Americans is a church. And that has been the place of refuge. And, and the black church is still the number one black institution in any black community uh, around the country. It is still the cornerstone of the black community. And also, um, you know, that that mentality uh, that you were talking about that really, again, reflects this ancient African um, uh, really kind of uh, nuance between kind of like, again, Christianity and Christendom, which are two totally different things. And we see that in Jesus, right? Jesus calls his people to grab a hold of him and to become a part of the kingdom of God. But that he 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 calls people to that uh, unapologetically, and then at the same time he vehemently denounces oppressive religion, and he he vehemently denounces you know the religion and practices of the Pharisees. And so we we see that same uh, spirit reflected in the ancient Egyptian church and the ancient Syrian church, and as you said in the Black church, because I think it was said no better than by Frederick Douglass who uh, in his biography talked about how he said, he, I think the way he put it was between the Christianity of Christ and the Christianity of this land, I recognize the widest possible difference. And he said, there's no good reason except for a deceitful one to call the religion of this land Christianity. And he said, I love the peaceful Christianity of Christ. And so therefore I hate the slave, the slave holding, slave whipping uh, lynching religion of this land. Because if you love the Christianity of Christ, Frederick Douglass says, you have to hate false Christianities that, that endorse oppression and vice versa. If you love oppressive perversions of Christendom, then that means you hate the Christianity of Jesus Christ. This is what Frederick Douglass said, and I think he put it real well. And as you said, he was born and raised in slavery. So even in the midst of slavery, even in the midst of having a heretical Bible, because the word has something to say about taking or removing words from the Bible. So having a, having a Bible, a so-called slave Bible that strategically removes the, the passages about freedom, and yet the Holy Spirit spoke to the slaves anyway. The Holy Spirit got around white supremacy and spoke to the slaves. And so the slaves sang Negro spirituals about going down and telling Pharaoh, let my people go. So the freedom message in scripture still arrived to God's people anyway. And so how powerful is that to know that the Holy Spirit still spoke to Frederick Douglass and spoke to the slaves and the slave and the Negro spirituals, even in the midst of, in the full kind of fleshing out of the American project of white supremacy in slavery and land theft. And in the middle of all that, Frederick Douglass was still able to nuance and delineate between there's this oppressive Christian Christian church thing that's going on, and that's from the devil. But then there's actually 
the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So if he could, if the Coptics could understand it in the, you know, six and seven hundreds, and if Frederick Douglass could understand it in the 1800s, then that's our encouragement, I think, for us today in the church as we are wrestling with church hurt and, and all these kind of things that, yes, I'm not trying to invalidate that. Uh, we need to lament and grieve and prophetically engage. But we just also have to be very clear, again, about the true gospel of Jesus Christ that leads to justice. And that's what we need to, that needs to be our refuge in order to deal with uh, and also to be able to, 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 to delineate and, and critique uh, any, any kind of heretical expression of the church. Oh, amen. And, and as you're talking, like, I'm just thinking about, like, how weak my faith can be. Like, I can be shook up and I could be, like, very angry at what I'm seeing on display for, for Christianity in America, uh, especially with the rise of Trump. And so, and sometimes I just like wring my hands, like I'm done. I'm like done. And like what, what you're saying and like, what's so beautiful about the black church and the black tradition is just, like digging in, like, that's not Christ. And I'm going to fight this. I'm going to get even deeper in this. I'm going to study my Bible even more. I'm going to go and reject this version of Christianity because that's not Christianity at all. And like, so I'm, I'm very much like listening to you. I'm very much just encouraged by the black church, just digging in, in the midst of all this, in the midst of not even having a legit Bible, having like a severed slave Bible, like the Holy Spirit moved through that and still strengthened the black church. And I look at that, I'm like, man, I can learn so much because I can, my weak, my faith is so weak at times where I'm like, I could feel like I'm done. And I haven't even dealt with what the black church has gone through. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So uh, I know we're up at our time. Um, so thank you so much for, for hanging out with me. I guess the last question I had is for, for parents listening in, I was talking with a friend of mine and I was asking him about like just raising children and how do we raise up this next generation of anti-racist children? And he was saying, he's like, you know how you raise racist children? And I was like, well, I can think of a couple ways. He's like, well, number one, don't address race in the home. Just, don't even talk about it. And I was like, really? And I, I started to begin to think about that. And I was like, that is so true. If you don't acknowledge it, that's one way to make sure your children are going to be racist in the future. So I was wondering, like, maybe uh, for last minute things, for those who are parents listening in, who are who are um, on this mission to build a more inclusive church, a more loving church, um, and they want to make sure their children are being raised properly. And any advice you'd have for parents on raising anti-racist children? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a that's a unique one. I don't um yeah, I don't get that one usually, but um I, I think it's a great one. I mean, I think that um you know, I think that uh you know, there there black people and white people have very and I I come from a, actually a mixed parent household. And so black people and white people have very different and very opposing uh parenting methods. <laughs> and that's something that that's something that I think we've carried from the African continent because black black parents uh I would say in general, and these are generalizations and nothing, no generalizations true for everybody. But in general, you know, I think a lot of time, and there's some good in this, white parents uh, love the idea of encouraging their children's individuality and, and nurturing their children's individual voice and not being too kind of authoritarian or, or, you know, but really wanting kids to feel free. And that's good in many ways. But I think that a lot of times, honestly, even in the way that white people sometimes parent can in and of itself exacerbate white supremacy. Uh, I always tell people if you don't, for white people, especially if they don't want their kids to grow up acting like they're the center of the universe, don't raise them like they are and, and, and help them to learn that from an early age. And that's, again, not to, you know, um, you know, uh, there, I think there's a lot of good in like white parenting styles as well. But I think that, as you said, addressing race and racism, and this is for all uh, people, uh, people of color, but especially for white parents to really be able to um, discipline their children in godliness, as the word tells us, and really discipline them in in racial solidarity. Um, and I think also, uh, but also especially for and for all people, but especially for people of color, I think it's really important to surround their kids with positive images of themselves and be very intentional about that. Um, you know, and to, and that's that is extremely hard to do. Uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of going and finding things to find cartoons and books and 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 events and and things to put kids around. But we, my my wife and I, we, you know, my wife is Puerto Rican, so we have multiracial children, and we are we are very intentional about like having our kids in in programs that are not only with Latinos but that are in Spanish. 
And then we have them in black programs, uh, like swimming classes and gymnastics program. We have them in white programs as well, because we want our kids to know how to be around all people. But we especially emphasize like with our books, we have them read or play dates. We get together. We want our kid. We, we have to be very intentional to make sure our kids are around other all of their background. And we also have they have Asian and Native American friends as well, because we want them to be exposed to uh, their own culture and their own identity and see themselves reflected, but also to learn how to be around other people from a from a very young age. And not only racially, but also socioeconomically. We want our kids to know how to flow in the hood. And we also want them to know how to flow in the suburbs. And, and so um, that's something that I would just say is like, yeah, like addressing issues of racism and also critiquing what they're watching with them so they can notice it. Like even little things like my kids are so woke. They're only nine and 11, but they're like, woke to me. Like they'll be, they'll be pointing out stuff all the time. Like that's racist, you know, like, like we'll be watching a movie, a cartoon. Right. And then as soon as an Asian character comes on the screen, all of a sudden you hear like a gong in the background mm. or you hear like an Arhu playing or something. And then the music sounds Asian all of a sudden. And my kids will be like, that's racist. They're only playing Asian music now because the Asian person's on. And I'm like, yes, that's right. There that's you go. <laughs> yeah, so I love like, that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, uh, what a beautiful message! And I, and I think the keys there you're talking about is like just being intentional as parents, um, and also just being intentional at everything about how do we be aware of white supremacy? How do we be aware of what we're taking in, whether it's the media, the books we're reading, and what are we doing to? Um, to educate ourselves, to be intentional, to grow in empathy and, and keep learning. Like it's never ending. We, we have so much to learn and it's beautiful to hear what you're practically doing with your kids to expose them to um, all different types of ethnicities through the different programs that they're in. Like what a beautiful experience they're going to be growing up in. And um, so that, that is what, what a great example you're setting. So Dr. Bonte, I want to thank you so much for being on the show and talking with us about African Christianity and just all the work that we all can be doing to better create inclusive environments in our churches. Hey man, thanks for having me. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.